I want to welcome you all. I'm Jean Howard. I happen to be chair of the Pembroke Associates Council this year. And we are an alumni group, and we support the Pembroke Center, which is um, a, st a center, an academic center that uh, studies um, difference of all sorts, gender difference, racial difference, um, ethnic difference. And the Pembroke Center does a number of things. It runs the sexuality uh, and gender concentration, which some of you have been a part as an undergraduate. It runs a research um, uh, seminar every year on a special topic. It very importantly collects archives, two kinds of archives. One archive consists of papers of major feminist theorists from the 20 and 21st century. It's the only archive of its kind in the world. The other archive, also important, co collects the papers of women of Brown in Rhode Island so that we can write different histories of the institution of which we've been a part. Um, and I love this day of all the meetings of the year because this is the one in which our graduating seniors give presentations um, <coughs> to us at lunch. And I want to welcome all of them. I'm sitting at a great table with three of the presenters and welcome their families as well. We're very glad to have you here. Um, I'm going to turn the program over in a minute to Drew Walker, who's the head of our undergraduate concentration. But first, I want to remind you, and I should remind myself, turn off your phones so we don't interrupt the students when they're halfway through their presentations. It'd be a test of their mettle. Um, but I also want to go around and have us all introduce one another so we knew who we are. And let's start with the table right here with Mary. Will you go first? Just tell us who you are. Hi, I'm Mary Vassalero, class of 74, parent of seven, and I'm going to be talking about how I came to Pembroke Associates. I'm Leah Sprague, class of 66, along with my fellow Indian, we're not trying to deal with this very much, but it's our 50th. Wow, wow, yay, yay. <laughs> Okay, let's go to the next table. Karen, would you start that table off? Um, I'm Karen Baby. I'm the director for our West Coast office. We actually have an office in downtown San Francisco in California, so I'm just out for the weekend. And if you're visiting San Francisco, come and see us. Great. Hi, my name is Diane Schweiger. I'm an administrative assistant for the Pembroke Center. Yay! Thank you for being here. I'm Joe McMaster, class of 1960, and I'm the past president of the Thank you. Um, Anne, would you start us off in that table? Sure. Anne Buell, class of 88. I'm from Connecticut. <laughs> Felicia Salinas. Oh, stand Moniz. up so we can all see you so we know who you are. <laughs> right. Felicia Salinas Moniz, uh, class of 2013, and also assistant director for the Saradola Women's Center. Oh, yes, good. Christy Law Blanchard, director of program outreach and development for the Pembroke Center. Andrea Rosaki, class of 82, um, came up from Washington today, and this is my first year on the council. Denise Davis, uh, managing editor of Differences and lecturer in Gender and Sexuality Studies. Wendy Snyder, class of 83, and I was class of 2013, and I'm on the Great. All right, let's go to this table. Drew, do you want to start us off? Sure. I'm 
Drew Walker. I'm the Associate Director of the Pembroke Center and the Director of the Undergrad Concentration in Gender and Sexuality Studies. I'm Nancy Buck, Class of 1965, <laughs> former, chair, former Chair of the Pembroke Associates Council. We're very um, surprised. Nancy always says class of 1965, the best class ever. What happened to your tagline, Nancy? Oh. <laughs> Suzanne Stewart Steiger, I'm the director of the Pembroke Center and I'm professor of comparative literature, Italian studies, and modern culture and media. And I'm a parent of class of 19. Great. I'm Shauna Stark, I'm class of 76, here for my 40th, and I had a daughter in 2010. I mean, graduated in 2010. <laughs> Great, and I, I'd like to just pause. She's six years old. Yeah. <laughs> no. I'd like to pause for a moment and say Shauna has helped us in our campaign to endow the archives, um, the feminist theory and the um, uh, Christine Dunlap Farnham archives. So we're very thankful for that and grateful. <laughs> There's no chauvinism in this group, none. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Victoria Westhead, and I'm also class of 83, and uh, parent of 2017 and 2019, and I'm the vice chair of the Pembroke Center Associates Council. I'm uh, Pam Aria, I'm class of 84. I have a son here, he's class of 18, and he's working the reunion at Bell, so maybe you see him around. <laughs> Okay, back table. Leora, you want to start us? Sure. Hey, I'm Leora Tannenbaum, a member of the council, class of 91. Uh, hi, I'm Penelope. I'm a graduating senior. That's great. <laughs> hi, I'm Yasin. I'm also a graduating senior. I studied public health and health and human bio. Hi, I'm Jasmine Waddell. I am a uh, class of 99, um, and I am uh, a member of the Pembroke Associates Council. Hi, I'm Arlen. I'm a first year PhD candidate in uh, modern culture and media, and we'll also be presenting. Great. And we just, yes, do you want to start us off? Yes, hi, my name is Nabi. Dad Melanie is presenting today. That's wonderful. Thank you for coming. Okay, so now we're going to hear from our awardees, and Drew Walker is going to do the introductions. Okay, um, thank you again, uh, and I want to welcome you. Thanks for coming, and I want to welcome you again, as Jean has welcomed everyone. Um, I would like to say. Uh, a word of congratulations to Jean as we get started. She will be receiving a, an honorary degree from Brown on Sunday. So we're thrilled to have uh, the director of the um, uh, Alumni Council uh, of the Pembroke Center receiving a, um, an honorary doctorate um, to go along with all of your other great accomplishments. Um, okay, so uh, just as a word of welcome, um, I, I, again, I want to thank you all for coming, um, and I'd also like to offer a few words of thanks. Um, I especially want to thank uh, the friends, families, and supporters of all of our wonderful students who produce outstanding work. Um, certainly that's important for their lives and also for the life of the college. Um, I want to thank the Associates Council 
whose support and generosity makes possible so much of what we do at the Pembroke Center, particularly these awards and grants and also our archives and, and our research projects. So thank you very much for your support. Um, I'd also like to thank my Pembroke colleagues who assisted in the process of selecting these students and who coordinated today's events. Donna Goodnow, Christy Law Blanchard, Martha Hamlet, Diane Straker, and of course Suzanne Stewart Steinberg. And I want to say a special thanks to our awards committee and especially to Denise Davis, who serves on all of our committees in addition to teaching in the department and working as the managing director, I mean editor of the journal Differences. Um, each year we do put together a committee and we receive a, 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 an awards, well, uh, awards and grants committees for each one of these categories. Um, and we receive a robust and impressive group of applications and nominations. And it's always a struggle to decide, not because these students are wonderful, but because so much of the work is outstanding. We could give many more awards. Um, so that's just a further testament to the quality of the work that is represented here today. And we're thrilled that you all are here to um, share your work with us. Um, not all of our grants and prize recipients are able to be here today, so I just want to um, acknowledge their work as well before I begin to introduce the presenters. Um, let's see, where's my list? So every year, uh, one of our categories uh, that we'll be hearing from today is the Steinhaus Zissen uh, Pembroke Center Research Grants for Undergraduate and Graduate Studies. Um, this grant supports undergraduate and graduate students um, to do research related to uh, women's education, health, community activism, philanthropy, economic status, and women's rights and well-being in the United States and developing countries around the world. And this year we had a, an amazing pool of, of applications for that and gave out quite a few awards, and I just want to note them here. Kwang Choi from Visual Arts uh, received a grant for his project, uh, Submerging and Resurfacing Multimedia Investigation of the Last Mermaids of Jeju. Noah Fields, class of 17 in classics, um, for his project, As I Watch You in Fleeting Glances, No Talk is Left Inside Me. Uh, Anna Gray Fish Fisher, who is a graduate student in the Department of History, for her project, Arrestable Behavior, Vulnerable Women, State Power, and the Making of Law and Order, America, 1932 to 1982. And finally, Lakshmi Padmanabam, <laughs> a uh, graduate student in the Department of Modern Culture and Media and History for her project Representing Rape, a Visual History of Feminist Protest in India. In addition, um, we also uh, give out uh, an undergraduate thesis prize, and we will hear from, uh, from Melanie, um, but we also give a, a prize for a dissertation prize, the Marie J. Lengua um, Dissertation Prize that this year went to Natalie Adler, um, from the Department of Comparative Literature for her uh, impressive project, Beyond the Poetic Principle, Psychoanalysis and the Lyric. So we congratulate all of those students for their wonderful work. Uh, yes, we can give them a round of applause. Okay, um, and so now I will present, or, or introduce, I should say, uh, those students who are here to present their work today. Each one of them will speak for about five minutes um, to give us an overview of their work and take a couple of questions as well. So first of all, we'd like to welcome um, Melanie Abe Ganawardana um, from the Department of uh, her Depart uh, English and Literary Arts, who received this year the Ruth Simmons Prize, which is a prize awarded annually for an outstanding honors thesis on questions having to do with women or gender. So we want to welcome. Hi everyone. Sorry about this. I don't know how to make it go back. Um, okay. she have yeah, that's fine. Um, thanks for coming out today. Um, and before I begin, I just want to say thank you um, to the Pembroke Center and to the al alumni and donors who made this possible. This is a huge honor. Um, and I also want to thank my advisors, uh, Professor Jacques Leap and Ralph Rodriguez, for their continued patience and guidance. Um, so for my English honors thesis, I chose to analyze a controversial topic in not only queer studies, but also real life, the lesbian butch femme couple, which I've been writing about and thinking about for most of my career at Brown. It's always been fascinating to me how butch femme is so often rejected not only in, 
in straight spaces, but also in LGBTQ spaces for strikingly similar reasons. Namely, because it's so often labeled a stereotype for its perceived parroting of heterosexual masculinity and femininity. In my sophomore year, I encountered the 1992 anthology, The Persistent Desire, ed edited by femme writer and archivist Joan Nessel, who fights back against these accusations with vibrant stories of butch femme life from the 40s and 50s to the 80s and 90s. Nestle and the other writers in the anthology describe how butch femme, as the most visible face of lesbianism, faced severe social repression from society at the same time it was often rejected by mainstream feminism. In 2012, another butch femme anthology, Persistence, was published, echoing Nestle's words. And I started wondering, if butch femme is constantly being rejected, how does it continue to materialize? By emphasizing and repeating the word persistence, the titles of the, anth of the anthologies beg the questions. How has the butch femme diet persisted for so many years, and why? What makes it persistent? And, more importantly, what persists through it? My project, entitled The Persistent Dialogue, Butch Femme is Queer Reading, attempts to approach these questions from the perspective of form, feeling, and most importantly, reading. More specifically, I argue that butch femme is produced by the process of queer reading that persists as a particular form of relation across bodies and across time. The project charts the ways that butch femme becomes legible to itself within the dyad, as well as the ways that it becomes a form irreduci irreducible to bodies or identities themselves. In this way, I aim to show how butch femme persists not simply as an important part of history, but as an ongoing, crucial mode of survival. When reading essays from The Persistent Desire, I noticed that many butch and femme writers describe their relationship using the language of reading and dialogue. To these women, the relationships hinge on an intimate process of emotional and erotic exchange between butch and femme partner. Analyzing essays from the anthology alongside queer theories of reading, I examine how butches and femmes negotiate boundaries in ways that resemble, and I argue become, processes of reading and interpretation. I trace the way that butch femme eroticism, as represented in these memoirs, generates a specifically discursive pleasure that radically reconfigures the body and the self as text. I argue that this process of reading allows butches and femmes to fashion alternative ways of working through trauma, historical and personal trauma. Um, my second chapter shifts its focus from memoir to cinema, juxtaposing Peter Strickland's enigmatic 2014 film, The Duke of Burgundy, alongside Robert Aldrich's butch femme lesbian classic, The Killing of Sister George, using sexual power dynamics as a frame through which to think about relation, repetition, knowledge, and sexuality. Specifically, I analyze the ways that The Duke of Burgundy hinges on a kind of dyadic reading, one that does not mobilize butch femme identities through a historical real, but instead refracts them through a vested interest in repetition and form. In this case, however, I analyze where, why, and how the knowledge exchanged between the dyad breaks down. This reading works with and against the forces of history in order to envision how the Duke of Burgundy might be read as an allegory for the butch femme histories depicted in The Killing of Sister George, and furthermore, how butch femme arises as a form at the occasion of its reading. Both chapters thus analyze the important kinds of feelings, affects, and knowledges that emerge from butch femme reading. In conclusion, I'll return to the words of Joan Nessel. They have been aching to tell how it was, how it is when the want is too large to stay in its place. So if butch femme want is consummated by telling and by reading, then what travels over time is that same form of communication, at times a phantom, at times a body, at other times, a particular gravitational force feeling that spins objects queerly into loving, into relation, and into survival. Thank you. OK, so next I would like to introduce Kristen Alcapina from Public Health, graduate of 2016. Uh, Kristen received this year the Helen Terry McLeod uh, Research Grant uh, that supports undergraduate honors research on issues having to do with women or gender, or research that brings a feminist analysis to bear on a set of problems or questions. Um, I just wanted to note, I think everybody may have seen this, but at everyone's table there is a longer description of each one of the, the grant categories and sort of a, a bit of a history about them as well. I just want to direct you to that if you're interested in that. Um, uh, I'm just reading just a quick synopsis of that. But most importantly at this point, let's introduce, uh, or let's uh, have Kristen come forward. Hi, 
Hi, everyone. My name is Kristen. I'm going to try to pull up the presentation. Um, so my thesis, uh, it's called Challenges on the Frontline, and it's, I focused on HIV services provided in Havana, Cuba, and to give reference, I uh, spent my junior year abroad um, and senior, no, sorry, junior spring, I was in Cuba, and throughout the semester I had done, um, my essays were tailored to um, HIV services in Havana already, so in time for my senior thesis, I continued on with what I would what I was already working on. Okay, and so just an overview, like in HIV in Cuba was first uh, present in 1986, and at the time their form of care was in a sanatorium, so everyone was kind of forced to live in similar conditions, um, confined into the space. And then in 94, they decided to um, have ambulatory care, which meant that people were treated able to live at home, and that was a big difference just because they get a lot of criticism in fact in the 80s and early 90s that they had forced people to live together um, and bringing everyone from different parts of the country. Um, so my objective was to conduct research uh, through qualitative interviews. I talked to health professionals, people that work in the Ministry of Public Health, and through the help of some health professionals, I also was able to interview HIV patients. Um, which really brought a lot of color into my thesis, and it wouldn't have been possible without the grant and without uh, going back to Cuba for the second time to my research. Um, and so I focused in uh, the area of El Vidal. Uh, Havana split into three different areas. Uh, Vidal, just to give reference, is area that is mostly um, uh, middle class. It's mostly represented as the area of um, where services are most, uh, are Sorry, uh, it's representative to how, um, sorry, I'm blanking. <laughs> um, it's basically the kind of the, the best example of how services are rendered. And so it was interesting just because my method, okay, so, sorry. Um, and then my methods, I, so I had three primary contacts and I had semi-structured interviews and I had open interview questions and everything was recorded through an audio. And, Oh, sorry. So this here is just representative of how, um, where, how spread out my interviews were. Um, the big circle there just reflects um, the area of Vidal. So basically what I'm saying is that Vidal is the area where I did most of my research. Um, and yeah, sorry. Um, so my results, I had four uh, themes overall. Uh, they reflected support systems, um, which, um, I had, uh, sorry, so support systems and what I found were that once someone has HIV, there are different types of workshops you can attend. There are support systems through your like mothers who unite uh, women to help uh, women that come together and promote HIV services and testing throughout the neighborhoods. Um, same with men who have sex with men because that is the, uh, the drivers of the epidemic in Cuba. And come. Uh, men who have sex with men. It represents about like 80% of um, HIV cases in Cuba. And then the rest of the uh, present are women. Yeah. And uh, confidentiality um, sorry, uh, basically was more on how um, the Ministry of Public Health has set up um, uh, through providers how they maintain confidentiality. One example is um, they make sure people keep up with their medications and um, uh, basically, uh, sorry, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm, so sorry. I'm really nervous for this for some reason, <laughs> in case you can't tell. <laughs> this is very different than when I do my thesis research, where it's more strict. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, but basically, confidentiality was more on like, my one of my primary contacts was uh, 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 STI nurse, and so she was the one who had main contact with HIV patient, her patients in the neighborhood, obviously, because she was in charge of them. And I was just very uh, surprised and very pleased with when the method they kept confidentiality in the sense that, like, 
you, um, when you when someone is HIV positive, they're expected to report everyone they've had um, sexual contact with in the last 10 years, and that's extensive. But it's her job to keep that confidentiality. If a patient doesn't feel comfortable coming to her office, she finds other ways, and that's representative throughout most of the system. It wasn't just in that area. Same with food. Um, since food is rationed in Havana, if you don't feel comfortable going up to your local area and receiving your food, there is a service provided um, where you can go to a different neighborhood, um, someone else can do it for you, and people are my, very much willing to work with the HIV individual, and it's more of, I was impressed, and because that kind of reduces the stigma, and it was brought into attention that they keep that in mind, and it's not just black and white. And access was, um, this was one of more of a, kind of an area in my thesis where it was more of a critique on the government, because it is, it is expected that the government is able to provide um, medication and uh, access to medication, uh, doctor visits. And um, through talking to patients, I found that they were really pleased with their relationship with the doctors. Um, their relationship with the doctors, they knew where to find the doctors, how to keep contact with them. But the one thing was more of access to their food and their medication, just because things don't always run on time. And when you are on ART, there's like a certain like cocktail of um, medication that you're on. And like, let's say one of them is missing and you haven't seen it for two months and you keep going to the pharmacy. Like that was a problem that some patients had. Um, and so that was more of like, how can you really say that you are um, providing the service when like so there are gaps in there? Um, but also like as a, like, a Cuban citizen, they don't really have, there wasn't really too much of an outlet to advocate for yourself. There are groups, like I mentioned earlier, um, the National Center, there are groups like the National Center of HIV Awareness, individual groups of promotion, but there's no one really to advocate for you. It's more like this is how it's done and like we're sorry. Um, that we can't really do more, it's coming, it's coming, you can keep saying that, but. And so future expectations were more, people expected um, maybe the economy would get better so that they could actually, the government could actually provide these services, medication, um, yeah. And so my limitations in my research were more of the location. So as I was trying to say earlier, that was really the area where things are expected to run perfectly, and so if they have these problems in an area that's supposed to be the best of the best, it's kind of questions like what other areas look like. And then but that also isn't the area where there's a high HIV prevalence, that's more in center Havana, a more touristic center. So I would like to continue my research and like to spread out to different areas um, just because it would add a lot more to the picture of what HIV looks like in Cuba. Um, but of course, like the reason why I had this limitation was more because of my primary contacts. Um, so <laughs> we'll see what happens in the future, but yeah. And thank you. <laughs> okay, so our next um, speaker is our only graduate student who's speaking today, Arlen Austin, who comes to us from the departments of modern culture and or the Department of Modern Culture and Media. Along with Beth Capper, um, he was awarded um, a Steinhaus Sisson uh, research grant, which I uh, th just briefly explained at the beginning. Um, and he will uh, now talk about his project, Wages Due. Thanks, Drew. Um, as Drew mentioned, uh, my name's Arlen. I'm a first year in the Department of Modern Culture and Media. Um, and I'm presenting today on behalf of myself and my colleague, Beth Caper, who's traveling for research. Um, and first off, we just want to say thank you to everyone at the Pembroke Center, all of the faculty, staff, alumni, and, and donors for your support of this project. Um, through funding from the Steinhaus Sisson grant, um, we've begun construction of an extensive digital humanities archive um, containing materials from the Wages for Housework movements of the early 1970s and some of the preceding welfare rights organizations of the late 1960s. Um, these movements, let's see, these movements present a very rich uh, combination of theoretical perspectives and activist tactics. 
Um, their provocations inspired much discussion and debate over fundamental questions of how our society organizes its own reproduction. Um, the collection we're putting together, scanned from the personal, um, personal archives of many of the women who participated in the movement, um, will make publicly available for the first time internal discussion documents and outreach materials, um, as well as um, some of the um, uh, more, more famous documents uh, produced by these movements, and as well as a contextual framing um, designed for a general readership uh, approaching the material for the first time. Um, and in preserving and making broadly available these materials, we really hope to facilitate an engagement, a broad public engagement with both the concrete demands, the activist tactics, and the more theoretical and grand utopian provocations of some of these movements. Um, after decades, uh, I think, returning to these archives still invigorates thinking about the relationships of feminist, queer, anti-racist thought and social justice work. Um, so we aim to tell two different sorts of histories with this archive. One is the very specific story of the women who were involved in the movement. Um, Wages for Housework grew out of meetings in 1971 in Padova, Italy, among women from four countries with broad experience um, within feminist, decolonial, and anti-racist struggles. Um, so did I go to the next slide? Yes. Yes. On the left, um, oh. I'm gonna make it into oh, thank you. Is it not full screen? Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so on, on the left, you uh, I'm sorry, on, the, on, the, on your left, my right, my left and right, you can, <laughs> I feel somewhat dyslexic here. You, you, um, you, well, you can tell which one is in Italian, obviously. That's one of the, the first um, flyers from the movement in Padova, Italy from 1971. And then you see a later elaboration of it um, from the movement in New York in 1973. Um, and here we have the founding statement. Um, uh, authored by many of the women who went on to form Wages for Housework groups in different countries. It was co-authored in 1971 in Padova. Um, and it affirms the need for an autonomous international feminist form of organizing, even as each participant is also involved in local struggles. Um, as they write, quote, feminism cannot be subordinate to class struggle, nor class struggle subordinate to feminism. They refuse to see feminism as something abstracted from particular situations, even as they insist that it must be an autonomous form of organizing on an international scale. Um, let's see. Um, in, a, uh, if, in a few years, the Wages for Housework groups have organized in London, New York, LA, Toronto, and many other major cities. Um, and they're beginning to articulate demands and do outreach, um, organize community centers. Um, and if anyone is familiar with the material, you'll know that they're not afraid of, um, of immodest demands, utopic and transformative demands. Um, so to part consciousness raising about all the invisible labor that women do in the home and part of demand for the overcoming of any sort of exploitative work relation. Um, you see texts like this one authored by, uh, authored anonymously by a member of the Toronto group. Um, I don't know if you can all read it. I'll just read a brief selection. Quote, we want wages for every dirty toilet, every painful childbirth, every indecent assault, every cup of coffee, and every smile. We want back the wealth we have produced. We want it in cash, retroactive, and immediate. <laughs> and we want all of it. <laughs> so there you go. Um, <laughs> so there's that one specific historical narrative about how the groups were formed and the individual women involved. And then there's a, a sort of broader historical background, which we're also trying to touch on in this digital archive. Um, and in this context, we're trying to show its connection to the great welfare rights movements of the US, which developed in the mid 60s, largely led by black women in urban centers of the northern US who were organizing populations displaced through the great migrations. Um, women forming welfare rights groups at the local level, which eventually coalesced in the mid-1960s under the umbrella of the National Welfare Rights Organization. And we've managed to acquire, um, I think, the entire run now of the publication of the National Welfare Rights Organization, which you see on the right or your left. 
a donor show, <laughs> um, which uh, was called the, uh, called the Welfare, uh, Welfare Fighter, which ran from 68 through 71. And on the other side, you see um, one of the early wealth, um, Wages for Housework publications of the New York Committee. And the, they were very much trying to extend upon the work um, of the National Welfare Rights Organization and form connections and, 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 and sort of write, write the history, make, make, make the history present um, in their own organizing. Um, so there you see, um, on the one hand, a announcement for a welfare rally that the Wages for Housework groups are organizing. On the other side, it's just a page from the Welfare Fighter showing the executive committee of the NWRO, National Welfare That's Rights. It, well, the founder was from Providence, George Wiley. I mean, the, the, the man who became the figurehead, who was eventually displaced by all the women in the group, yes, was from Rhode Island. And, and yes, and there was actually an interesting Rhode Island connection. We're looking at some archives in Rhode Island, yeah. Um, so some of the, some of the um, materials that we'll present have been widely anthologized. I mean, I'm sure all of you who, who've lived through or studied um, feminist movements of the 70s are, are familiar with many of them. Many of them became central in debates about uh, domestic work and the relations between sex, race, and class. Um, we see two of the most classics here. Um, but then there is a giant literature that is not often reproduced. Um, extensive studies by authors who are virtually unknown and that cover a huge range of topics that informed the movement itself, topics ranging from decolonial movements in the West Indies, the welfare rights movements of the major northern metropolitan areas of the US, the Italian radical left, which was extremely important in the formation of the groups, the feminist movement's growing interest in psychoanalysis and uh, different contemporary strands in Marxism. Um, so I each of these pamphlets we're showing here, are, are, are many of them are multi-hundred page pamphlets which contain um, great anthologies of writing which have been very little um, distributed, I think. And uh, also within the archive, you find um, fascinating histories of semi-autonomous organizations, which came together under the banner of Wages for Housework International. Um, and they give sort of important insight in how it was that groups that uh, wanted to preserve relative autonomy of their concerns and work, you know, came to work together in an international feminist movement. Here we have the, the birth announcement for black women for Wages for Housework. Um, and here we have uh, Wages Do Lesbians, which produced fabulous texts. Um, and then there's, a, there's another literature, which is almost totally inaccessible, um, which are the flyers that the, the, the groups produced, which they just would use as cheap dispensable pamphlets to be left in laundromats, welfare offices, daycares, etc. And they address in simple, concise language a range of concerns from uh, um, abortion and maternity care to housing and welfare, lesbianism and child custody, etc. Um, so it's a really wonderful um, literature that we're hopefully able to preserve. Um, and then there's also a large photographic archive. We get great pictures of some of the protests you see here in, in, in Padova in the early 70s, in um, the opening of the storefronts in Brooklyn and the, the meetings on welfare rights. Um, we're also going to include um, a lot of media coverage of the movement, which is totally fascinating because it, it sort of runs the gamut from um, sympathetic to utterly confused, to utterly hostile. You see here, this is the um, profile that Life Magazine did on the movement in 1975. Um, in addition, we'll include lots of the coverage from the time, um, which uh, engaged with debates about the remuneration of housework at a, at a governmental level and how those debates played out in the mainstream media. Um, and this isn't especially visually compelling, but I think, um, Part of what will make the archive really wonderful for, for scholars is that we've, we've managed to acquire permissions to, to distribute many of the internal discussion documents where you, know, you see a movement really working out its own demands and how they're received by the public and how they might need to be rearticulated and internal controversies. So you, get, you really get the feeling of a living, breathing movement as well as many texts um, in draft form. So you see them go through multiple revisions. Um, I think that's it. So thank you all very much. <laughs>
Sorry, I'm trying to make sure. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, so um, thanks, Arlen. Um, our next uh, presenter is Penelope Karitsis, who received uh, a Linda Pay undergraduate research grant, which supports an undergraduate research project related to issues of women's empowerment, such as gender equality in the workplace, access to reproductive health care, and women's political leadership. So we want to welcome uh, Penelope to the Hi, I just want to thank everyone for being here today, and I want to thank the Pembroke Center for graciously funding this research project, and also my thesis advisors, and um, Professor Anila Duletsai and Professor Alina Shi that aren't here today. They're brilliant scholars and amazing mentors, and um, yeah. I'm going to start by, with two quotes from my field notes. Um, the first one is by Georgios Kiritsis. We have no familio. We just have the same last name, <laughs> but um, he's the spokesman for Greece's Governmental Committee on Refugees. Um, we have to be human and decent. If someone is ill, dying, underage, or pregnant, we are not going to send them back. We understand that this is a difficult process. It involves misery. It involves despair. It involves everything. And in this quote, he's talking about the EU-Turkey deal. Um, that I'll go into more details a bit later on. And the second quote is from Dominique. Um, who is a transgender woman who's been working as a, as a sex worker in Marseille for 30 years. Uh, remember how I told you that working on the street was hard for me? But this, working here, was even harder than selling sex. I never cried, I never suffered like I've suffered here. Um, in this quote, she's commenting on her experience as working as a peer educator for a nonprofit uh, community health organization for sex workers. And the suffering she's referring to is due to the extreme condescension and infantilizing attitudes she was subjected to by other members of the organization, uh, be it social workers, uh, psychologists, students interning, who didn't take her 30 years working in the sex industry seriously. Uh, and she articulates suffering when she describes the way she was subjected uh, to discourses of victimization adopted by the organization that ironically prides itself as working with sex workers. Um, and the treatment of sex workers as victims is not unique to this organization at all. It is actually like a core principle of many organizations that try to help sex workers and end sex trafficking. Um, and there are similar tones of this victimization rhetoric in the quote that I read by the spokesman for the refugee, uh, for refugees in Greece. Um, and he's referring to the European Union's deal with Turkey, in which Turkey has agreed to take back refugees who have landed in Greece through the Aegean smuggling route. And the deal has been widely condemned as an inhumane approach to migrants and refugees. Um, in his words, he indicates that although he acknowledges the harsh nature of this agreement and the devastating impact this will have on the lives of refugees, there are certain people for whom this treatment would be more devastating than others. And that is like pregnant women, children, and people who are ill. And in my research project, um, I try to take seriously the people that are embroiled in these discussions um, that connect the issue of sex trafficking and the refugee crisis. Mainstream discourses emanating from the media, um, global governance and humanitarian organizations put forward the argument that with more women and girls arriving to the EU, governments need to be more uh, vigilant and spend more research, uh, resources to prevent uh, and address human trafficking. Um, thus framing refugees as potential victims of human trafficking. Uh, and by studying uh, sex trafficking in Marseille and the effects of the contemporary refugee crisis in Athens, um, I aim to contribute to the scholarship that provides an alternative to this view. I too see these issues as being connected, uh, these issues being the contemporary refugee crisis and sex trafficking. Um, but not because refugees and victims of sex trafficking are vulnerable to the exploitation of traffickers or smugglers. Um, I see that these two issues intersecting because similarly to those who are labeled as victims of sex trafficking, refugees are vulnerable to the powers of the state and to border policies that are rooted in colonial traditions of exclusion. Um, my research, for my research, I did ethnographic research in well, I said the, research, the word research seven times, um, in Marseille in the summer of 2015 and in Athens in the winter of 2016. 
Um, my, myth, my methods consisted mostly of gathering formal and informal interviews from sex workers, uh, migrants, and social workers. And my analysis belongs to a post-colonial legal framework that interrogates the role of anti-trafficking and migration laws as sites of exclusion. And I use this framework in dialogue with Nicola Mai's concept of sexual humanitarianism, which is the management of sex workers and sexual minorities through humanitarian interventions, and Ted Ducole's white savior industrial complex, which is an approach to social problems that satisfies the sentimentality of the white Western middle class instead of addressing how the workings of the global economy reproduce inequality. And just to, co to conclude with my main point or my main argument is that the humanitarian discourses, these legal and humanitarian discourses provide practices that rely on a victim criminal binary that ultimately reifies power structures in terms of race, gender, and sexuality, and ethnicity, and specifically, I was interested in how the construction of the figure of the refugee uh, or the sex trafficking victim as innocent others um, serves to fortify sexual humanitarian borders by promoting and legitimizing security-based policies and the militarization of borders in Europe that end up marginalizing and excluding those who are not deemed worthy of the victim label. And that's all I have to say for now. Thank you. So before the last speaker, I just want to say what a pleasure this has been. Uh, as somebody who reads the applications at the beginning, besides the, the theses and the, and the dissertations, we just see the proposal. So it's really great to see how these projects have like been fleshed out. Uh, it's, it's really been wonderful. Um, so for the last, uh, our last presenter today is Yasin So from Health and Human Biology. Uh, she was awarded a Bar Barbara Anton internship grant. Um, for, uh, for doing an honors thesis involving an internship or volunteer work in a community agency. Um, and the thesis and community work must be in some way related to the welfare of women and children. So she's going to present on her work on project care. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I just wanted to say thank you um, to the Pembroke Center for your gracious gift. And thank you to my thesis advisors as well. This has been a three year process and it's finally coming not to an end, but to an end for me, but it's just starting for um, the Providence community. And I'm very excited to be here and present this with you all. So um, my project is called Project CARE, and um, the CARE stands for Contraceptive Awareness and Reproductive Health Education. And um, I developed an intervention that is targeted to um, women who are currently incarcerated. So I can't talk about um, growth of women under correctional supervision until I talk about incarceration in the United States in general. So we know that um, the exponential increase of incarceration has been characterized as an epidemic in the United States. And unfortunately, this epidemic has disproportionately affected um, certain racial groups in the United States, and um, especially the people of color and those who are low income. And we can see this exponential um, increase due to several policy changes, such as the war on drugs and sentencing changes. Um, and an increase in community corrections. And community corrections basically refers to, pro to parole and probation. And what people don't realize is that if you are on probation, if you are on parole, that's another entry to incarceration. Because if you do mess up or if you do break the law again, you're sentenced for another crime. Um, and then, like I have mentioned before, there are several socioeconomic and racial disparities um, that characterize the growth of not only women, but also men under correctional supervision. For example, um, black men and Hispanic men and women are more likely to be incarcerated and are, um, they have the highest rates of incarceration in the United States today. Um, and so when we look more closely into why incarceration is an epidemic, um, we fall into a lot of reproductive health issues um, that 
women who are incarcerated usually have higher have higher rates of reproductive health issues compared to women who are not incarcerated, and this includes a higher risk of unplanned pregnancy and STIs, including HIV. Um, there's a disproportionate number of acute and chronic illnesses, such as substance abuse problems and undetected health issues. Um, and then you have to also be cognizant of the fact that um, this population has a high history of physical or sexual abuse and which may result in STI or pregnancy resulting from sexual victimization. Um, and then this history of physical or sexual abuse is compounded by um, the high mental health issues in this population. And given these high rates of um, ill health, we have to be cognizant of the fact that there are few studies of, about birth outcomes. There are few studies about incarcerated women in general, um, concerning the fact that this population is ignored because um, the general population sometimes tends to think that, okay, so they're incarcerated, they're not our problem anymore. Um, but unfortunately, we have high rates of recidivism, so these women who are going to prison eventually have to come out. And when they are out in the community, they don't have the resources or don't have the support system available for them to um, address all of their health issues and their social issues. And again, like I mentioned before, there's issues with health literacy. And so given these issues, we have to realize that incarceration is a public health concern, but, is, but it, it is also a public health opportunity, given the fact that um, in, in people that are incarcerated have the right to um, obtain health care. Um, jails and prisons offer the opportunity to reach populations that are vulnerable or reach populations that may not be able to be reached once they are in the community. And so given this fact, I've developed the Project CARE video series. And the aim of the video series or the goal is to help um, incarcerated women make more informed reproductive health decisions. And I'm going to talk more about how I plan to do that. So I mainly use message targeting and message tailoring. So what's very unique about Project CARE is that it is targeted to incarcerated, incarcerated women. And what I'm trying to test or figure out is, does does individualized tailoring work when trying to give recommendations on birth control? So for example, any research project, you have an intervention group and you have a control group. So the intervention group um, and the control group both have a pre-questionnaire. And this questionnaire is unique because it provides several questions about their lifestyle, um, um, preferences they have about birth control. And um, if you're in the intervention group, after you do the questionnaire, you will watch video one, video two, and a collection of contraceptive clips. So video one is a birth control overview, just provides you with um, information on um, what the purpose of Project Care is, why you're gonna be watching the videos. Video two gives an overview of all of the contraceptive methods. However, it focuses on the positive attributes because we want women to see the um, positive um, information about birth control rather than the negative. And then because this is, um, because the woman is in the intervention group, she would proceed to watch three contraceptive clips. And so these clips are short videos, about 30 minutes, I mean, excuse me, 30 seconds to a minute. And each video um, it corresponds to one um, contraceptive method. So for example, if she took the questionnaire and she takes the questionnaire on the computer, after she takes the questionnaire, it will provide her with three recommendations for birth control options. For example, the pill, the patch, and the ring. And then after watching video one and video two, she would proceed to watch um, contraceptive clips on the pill, the patch, and the ring. And so you can see, like I mentioned before, with the tailoring, each woman will receive individualized responses on um, recommendations for birth control. So for the control group, although she will take the questionnaire, she will not receive um, individualized responses. So they will just watch video one and video two. So the goal is to see, you know, did the the group of women who had the contraceptive clips, were they more likely to seek out birth control once they were, um, once they received care in the, excuse me, once they received care in the healthcare clinic. So this is just brief like overview or screenshots of what the videos look like. 
Um, and also, each woman will receive a printout. And um, the printout just, just has general information on all the contraceptive methods that are available for them at the prison. And um, the women who, do, who are in the intervention group who are the same women who receive the um, individualized responses will be able to write them down on their sheet um, on their printout that they receive, and the printout will also give them information on how to talk to a healthcare provider about reproductive health. And so we're hoping that they can take this printout with them to their next visit at the healthcare, healthcare clinic at the um, Rhode Island ACI. And again, the control group does just has the same printout. It just doesn't have the option to write down um, their their contraceptive methods. So um, our goal is to send the questionnaire responses to the jail clinic, and we plan to recruit women who just um, were sentenced or who just got into jail, so that way um, they can receive the intervention and process the information before going to the healthcare clinic so they have the opportunity to make their own decisions and form their own choices about birth control without the bias or the influence of a healthcare provider. Um, and the provider, is also going to use um, Project Care to their advantage because they will acquire um, additional context about the patient before they see them. Um, and the questionnaire results will share more specific, tailored information about family planning. Um, and so that way, the um, healthcare provider can spend less time gathering background information and medical history. So in terms of next steps, so this summer, we, we, we will be starting the implementation of this project at the Rhode Island um, Adult Correctional Institute, specifically at the Bernadette Building, which is the Women's Minimum Security Building. And um, one student will be doing this implementation process through the Damiano Fellowship. I will still be involved, but I will be more so the project director. And um, during the summer, we also plan on um, creating an intervention dissemination plan, which means that um, we're trying to figure out ways to structure the intervention and um, package it so that way we can share it to other correctional health care facilities. Thank you. about my duties. Um, thank you all very much for coming and thank you for our five presenters. Those were really interesting and it really shows why the Pembroke Center is in, an important place to sponsor work like this with our undergraduates. So we're grateful to all of you. We're grateful to the academic sponsors um, who helped shape these and to Denise and to Drew for their work in bringing all of this up to, to a good, good ending. So I think unless there are more announcements, we will, some of us are going to move downstairs to a business meeting, and I hope I see the rest of you around the campus this weekend. <laughs>